I have a gift that I cannot give away, for I have tried and tried. The gift that keeps on giving are the tears that I cry. But everywhere I turn, people turn away from my pain. They turn their back with a silent request for me to look like a picture in a frame. I am too beautiful, too special, too smart to carry such anguish. Talking about my pain is like speaking a foreign language. Some cultures give you 48 hours to bury the dead, but the pain that I carry got buried in my head because there was no mourning for the child that died. So I carried her around inside of me like she was still alive. Now she seemed to be invisible to everyone else, so I created voices in my head to talk to her. I thought they would help me protect her. Instead, they too rejected her. So as I got tired of carrying all of the dead weight around, along with all of the voices in my head and all of their sounds, I reached out to you and you and you, but you told me to forget about her too. Friends tell me to smile, even though I hurt, just smile. Friends tell me that just one of my tears is big enough to drown a relationship. And my family thinks that my pain is just a figment of my imagination. I am too beautiful, too special, too smart. So the voices in my head keep fighting and healing never starts. Meanwhile, the ones who murdered my childhood walk around free while I spend 40 years trying to resuscitate me. How do you revive a heart that's gone cold? How do you save the life of a seven-year-old trapped inside the body of a grown lady with a brilliant mind, but who cries like a baby? There were occasional pauses in the pain and new signs of life, like when I became a mother and when I became a wife. The voices in my head finally went to sleep. For a while, the pain didn't run so deep. The pain became numb from mothering tasks because even the voices in my head could not keep up with all the questions that my children ask. So finally, I get to live through a childhood, yes, vicariously mine. My real life children got, away with, got, got along with my inner child just fine. In fact, she was so happy she could finally play and feel safely alive. It's like the little girl inside of me never died. But real life children grow up and move away. But my traumatized child, she didn't age a day. She and her pain sit invisibly still, slowly but surely losing her will to reach out, to go on, to invite others in while hoping someone would see beyond the grown up grin. But I am too beautiful, too special, too smart. The world needs me to play my part, show the rewards for living with perfection. Success doesn't come with heartfelt compassion. So today, I offer you the gift. The gift that usually gets dismissed like Monday's junk mail that gets thrown into a pile of recycled paper until trash day, when the city becomes responsible for taking it away. Now before you tell me that it's gonna be all right, can you hear what I have to tell? Can you honor the fact that the pain inside of me runs as deep as a well? Before you put your arms around me and say, I am too beautiful and too special and too smart, can you listen to my aching heart? Before you wipe the tear from my eye, can you acknowledge that I am hurting and for one moment in time, can you please just help me carry my burden? Because there is nothing spiritual about being so strong that your strength covers up your perpetrator's wrong. And there is nothing godly about holding back a tear. Courage has nothing to do with hiding fear. And if you think that pain is what makes a survivor stronger, you need to listen just a little bit longer. 
to what I have to tell you about what I've been through. Please don't dismiss me like the others do. I still mourn for the childhood that I never had. And thoughts that I am unlovable still make me sad. And I have yet to silence the voices that argue amongst themselves so loud in my head that I feel so insecure and sometimes wish that I were dead. <clears throat> Pain does not build you up. It brings you down, but it is in the sharing of pain where healing is found. Sharing my pain is a gift to you. Please don't dismiss me like the others do. Embrace your pain and sit with it for a spell, long enough for it to become your testimony to tell. Even this poem is intended to create space. Stop pushing pain away with such haste. Use it to recognize your own healing to be done. I know that I am not the only one. I now ignore those who console me not to cry. Don't suggest that I forget about my pain. I won't even try. Healing, hearing, sharing my pain is a gift to you. Please don't dismiss me like the others do. I may not understand your pain, but I will give you space to explore it. Bring me your tears and tell me you hurt. I promise I will not ignore it. Because if you could follow the tracks of my tears, you would be glad that I am finally here. Embrace me in your arms and open your ears. Promise to listen and say that you will hear what I cannot put into words. Even these words don't suffice. For every single word I've spoken, I've cried twice. What I have to say to you might fall from my eyes, not just come from my lips. I hope the next time that you hear someone cry, that my gift to you will stick. Thank you. My name is Rosina Bakari, and I am an invisible victim of an invisible crime. It is a crime that a mother cannot face. It is a crime that a wife refuses to face. It is a crime that the justice system is not equipped to face. There is no police record. There is no family outcry. There is no neighborly support. I am a victim of incest and childhood sexual abuse. By the time that I could speak of it, nobody cared. Nobody cared about the almost 30 year old therapist having post-traumatic flashbacks of rape at age seven, waiting or wanting to kill herself over a coerced sexual relationship at 18, or the shame of being molested for two whole years between the ages of 14 and 16. Even my own mind betrays me by repressing memories and leaving only boogeyman images and traces of events. So my body fills in the gaps with fainting spells and fibroids, seizures, arthritis, gray hair since the age of 21. Thank you, Ms. Clairol. And even a pinhole in my heart. Yes. My body remembers what my mind forgot. But I fight back with my third degree black belt in Taekwondo. And when I can't fight, I run marathon miles. I strengthen my heart in a weight room and I dance to remind myself that my body is now free. Because I have calculated that it takes approximately 10 hours of intense exercise every week to manage my post-traumatic stress disorder from being an adult survivor of childhood sexual abuse and incest. I have been living openly as a survivor for the past five years, 30, after 30 years of silence. Now living openly does not mean that I am proud of incest, but it does mean that I am no longer ashamed. 
It doesn't mean that I am acting like a victim, but it does mean that I recognize my purpose. And it doesn't mean that it is a request, it, it is a request for pity, but it does mean that I recognize I am no longer a victim. Now, there are those who prefer that survivors remain invisible. To them, I say, hell no. We have been invisible long enough. It is time now for us to create safe space. Because one thing I realize is that if we don't take responsibility for creating safe space for ourselves, it will not be created. More than half of survivors of childhood sexual abuse will never tell a soul. Of the half that do tell, most of them will not be supported in their healing. Some will simply not be believed. Some will be believed and blamed for the abuse. Some, like me, will be, will be believed and directly requested to keep quiet to support the family. Rarely is the violator admonished for his or her actions, much less brought to justice. Because how the family looks is far more important than any individual in the family or how they feel. Rarely is the choice made to create safe space for the survivor. The survivor is left to figure out how to create physical distance between themselves and their violators because they often remain part of the same shared environment. And what I can tell you about being an invisible victim is that you have, you develop a profound sense of insignificance. The question looms over you for a lifetime. Why won't anyone acknowledge my pain? Why won't someone love me enough to hear my pain? And each sacrifice that you make to be in the company of those who ignore your pain, you feel smaller and smaller. You have no idea what it feels like to really matter in the world. Because when your pain is so big and you are told to ignore it, the only way you can do that is to make yourself small. And you get to the point where you feel like if you have to be that small, you might as well not be here at all. So it's no wonder that most adult, adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse and incest live with suicide ideation on a daily basis. Now, there are over 45 million survivors of adult childhood, of childhood sexual abuse, adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse. Now, I use that figure, but it's really an imaginary figure in my mind. Because in 2010, I began a mission to find these survivors. Not really because I wanted to help them, but because I needed them to help me. My hope was that they could console me, confirm for me my pain, or teach me how to let it go. It is literally that number that keeps me going many days. There are 45 million people who have stories like mine, but it's only a number in my head. In 2010, I wrote and performed a play that had a total audience of over 500 people. In 2011, I did a project that drew about 150 people. In 2012, I did a series of workshops that reached about 200 people. And this year, recently, I did another workshop that reached 100 people. Now, doesn't matter how poor you are at math you know that those numbers don't add up to anything close to 45 million. So, where are these survivors? Why are they not showing up to collaborate my pain? 
They are nowhere to be found, seemingly. So I've asked myself this question. Why are they hiding like I did for 30 years? I have a Facebook site, um, Talking Trees, Adult Survivors, and I have about 1,500 fans. And I get mail one way or another um, on a regular basis that explains to me some of the absence of survivors. And they go something like this. My family doesn't know. I'm too ashamed. I don't want my family to know, so I can't post. I feel responsible for what happened, even though I was four years old. I don't really know if it was abuse or not, even though I was six years old. My spouse doesn't know. I don't want to be labeled as a survivor. Now, interestingly, these are some of the same reasons while survivors also don't show up in therapy. And when they do show up, they frequently, typically don't disclose the abuse unless they've been in therapy for somewhere around three years. So where are they? Well, it apparently seems like we're taking some of that pain to prison. And we're taking some of that pain to the drug rehab center. And we're taking some of that pain to the physician. Because those are all places where adult survivors are <coughs> overrepresented in the population. Now, I refuse to have my fibroid uterus removed before the age of 50 in spite of my doctor's three-year recommendation. On November 14th, 2012, I turned 50. And on December 12th, 2012, I had a total abdominal hysterectomy to remove what my doctor labeled an angry uterus. All I could think was she had no idea how angry it really was. But I'm not willing to go to the rehab center. And I don't think that other survivors should have to go there either. And I'm surely not willing to go to prison. And I'm even tired of going to my physician. Over the last 20 years, child sexual abuse has significantly declined. We have done a remarkable job on prevention by calling on community and families to take responsibility. We told them what to look for, what to do, what to say, who to tell. But we have not expanded those resources into healing tools when prevention fails. When we lose the fight and have to live with the knowledge that we have failed a child and that child is now an adult, we put our heads under the pillow and sweep the problem under the rug. Hush, hush. Afraid to acknowledge family dysfunction. Afraid to admit our American failure. And hiding from our own cultural shame. We have failed to reach out to survivors. So each day that I wake up, I realize that there is work to be done. Because 45 million people is too large to be made so small. My name is Rosina Bakari, and I am a survivor of incest and childhood sexual abuse. Are you, and are you ready to heal? Thank you. When did you start getting treatment? Oh, um, I went to therapy uh, when I was 29 was the first, was my first, or 28 was my first disclosure in therapy. And then I went back into silence after three sessions. 
<laughs> was there a certain point that all of a sudden just clicked to make you want to be able to talk and, and help you talk about it? I don't. I think. Um, I think probably most survivors who live openly will probably tell you that there's something in their lives that happens that not make them want to, but make. But there comes a point where that becomes your only survival. Like either, you know, it's kind of like either do or die. Whatever happens, the denial just gets too great to live with anymore. Um, and so, so it kind of builds up to that. I, one of the things I didn't mention in this talk is that the average age for survivors to begin dealing with their survivor issues is in their 40s. So people typically go through there. And I think that's because there's enough life distractions for people that, like, like it was for me, that they can avoid a lot of issues. And as we, you know, as we move along in our 40s and life slows down, we have fewer distractions, and you kind of start thinking about who you are as a human being and your life choices and chances and all that stuff, then, you know, I always tell survivors, oh, don't, work. don't be in a hurry to deal with it because it'll, it'll find you sooner or later. You don't have to go look for it. <laughs> it will find you, and when it does, you can, you know, you'll, you'll have plenty of opportunity to deal with it. So, you know. What's your family like um, now? Because I know you were saying when you were little, they made you, you know, they said yes, that happened, but they, you know, said don't say anything. I, I don't, I don't speak. Since I've been living openly, I don't, I have very minimal contact with my family, which is, again, very typical. So, <coughs> yeah, minimal, I mean, like, almost non-existent. So. Can you describe the play for us? Yes, I'd love to. Thanks for asking about that. It's called Talking Trees. Everything I do is called Talking Trees. And um, um, I actually hope to, hope to perform it again this coming year. And so if you hear about it, then go see it. But uh, I talk a lot about um, voices in my head. And I do that. And I, and I try to uh, approach healing from the perspective of voices and the survivors having these voices in their head that they talk to, one of the things that happens in, in development uh, that makes childhood victims very different from adult victims is that, it, is that development has not occurred yet. So there's not an idea of what is normal, what the world is, you know. I mean, that's what development is. It's supposed to give you tools to deal with to know that the world is a safe place as you age so you can have healthy interactions with people, et cetera, et cetera. So whereas if you are victimized as an, as an adult, as horrible as it is, you know, you have something to sink your, you know what you're supposed, you at least have an idea of what you were before that, something to go back to. But when you're, when you're victimized as a child, you don't have that. So, um, so development has to occur, you know, because development is, most part, a lot of parts of development just occurs naturally. And so, so one of the things that happens is when the trauma is not dealt with, and most psychologists, um, uh, or many psychologists speak of the whole idea of, um, of, of, of um, being stuck uh, uh, at certain development levels. And so when you get stuck at certain development levels, you don't get to move on. Obviously, you really do move on because you're in a world, so you're not being seven. But the, but part so the brain has a tendency to uh, to fragment, and you become these other personas. And when you talk about that, a lot of times people talk, people get nervous. Survivors sometimes get nervous when we have conversations about voices in the head because our only association with that is is a disorder like multiple personality disorder. And those are extreme, those are really disorders, but fragmentation is not a disorder. Like we do it all the time, the same way that you're different in school, and you might be a complete party animal when you leave the classroom, but in the classroom, you don't say anything. Well, that's kind of like a persona. And so we carry a lot of those, um, or a lot of those around with us in our heads. So oftentimes there's a, the wounded child, you may have heard that term before, the wounded child that still lives within, there's the adult child. Um, and then there may be some other personas, depending on how many times, the, how many perpetrators you've had or what your life experiences may have been. 
So I say all that to talk about the play because it's interesting because the play has five people in it and it looks like there are five people in it. It looks like there's a play about five survivors except some people, and usually sometimes survivors get it when they, don't, when they, when they um, read it or see it. It's actually about the five voices in my head. They're not five different people, but they're the five different voices um, um, that I carry, you know, carry around with me, uh, so to speak. So uh, the idea of the play is to, is to uh, capture all of the intense feelings that you carry, carry around with you uh, as a survivor, most of which you don't get to display, you know, or talk about or hold. So it's kind of a way to really kind of um, release the whole idea of this, you know, these conversations that constantly, constantly go on in my head, you know. So I always sometimes I tell people, like, if you ask me a question, and I hesitate answers because, you know, they're collaborating, you know. <laughs> so, so they're trying to decide whose turn, whose turn is it. Like, that's not a question for me. That's a question. You know? so, uh, uh, so that's what the play is about. So, again, it seemingly looks like it's a play about five survivors. It's really not. It's really a play about the voices in the head. Are you, are you, I am. Are you overprotective? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Much to their displeasure. <laughs> my children are 21, and, uh, and uh, my, my daughter will be 20 in August. My son is 21, my daughter will be 20 in August. So, yes, very protective, even at their ages. Um, you indicated, I think, that you had three different situations. Mm -hmm. Were they all family? Mm -hmm. They were all yeah. family situations. Yeah. Three and three is the average number of violators that survivors have. And again, we don't all like you don't know this, like you don't grow up knowing this. You don't know it until and this is one of the other important reasons for people to for that I try to encourage survivors to live openly because as long as you're not talking about it and not sharing and stuffing everything, you think that your situation is so unique. I mean one of the one of the things that really pushed me to live openly because I'm a researcher, I like stats, I like numbers, they're important to me. When I read, and I don't know why I had never read the number before, well, well when I was younger we didn't have the internet, um, but, um, so information is more, is more readily available. But when I saw the number of 40, and, that, and this was five years ago, so the number was um, 40 million. When I saw the number of 40 million survivors, like I was absolutely floored. I was absolutely floored like that 40 million people had similar stories. Some were more intense, some were less intense, maybe whatever, but that there were 40 million people and I had not met five of them. Like how, how could this be? You know, so, so when you live openly, you, it's, it's not unless you live openly that you allow yourself access to information like that that reminds you it's not you, you're not the only one. And so, uh, so yeah, so for those 40 million people, the average number of violators that, that we have is three. But you don't know that because you just live in your isolated world, you know, with all the guilt and the shame. And so unless you're giving yourself access to information, you just think that you're the only one walking around with a sign on your forehead that says, abuse me, you know, so. Is it, is it um, the average three, is it generally um, all family? Or is that just? Um, if I got my numbers right, okay. The, the easiest number to remember is that of all the sexual abuse, childhood sexual abuse that occurs, only 10% occurs with strangers. Only 10%. So it's interesting because whenever you get in a room, typically of people when they talk about prevention, they're always telling you what they tell their children. I'm like, yeah, but do you tell them your children that even if it's your dad? Because that's the conversation that's scary for people to have even if it's your father, even if it's your grandfather, even if, you know, those are, so, they, so it's just so, it's so, it's so heart-wrenching to have to have that conversation with a child. And really, you can't because a child's not developmentally capable of even understanding those conversations. So you can't really tell a child actually what a good touch is. Any touch by daddy is a good touch. Like they don't, they don't, they can't, they don't have that. You just like, so, so we're limited automatic, by nature we are limited even in what we can do for prevention. So, uh, so, 
So 10% are occur with the strength with the stranger. Only 10%, right? That's that's contrary to what we would like to believe, you know. 50% of uh, abuse occurs within the family system. Uh, mother, father, brother, sister. That's 50%. And of that 50 and of the other um, 30 to 40%, that occurs within the family system itself. Another 30%, with another 20 to, between that 40%, either the, within the family system itself or people who are close enough to be called family, like the reverend, you know, or the, or the coach who, you know, sits by your parents at, at the game and tell you how wonderful your child is, that sort of stuff. So they're family members or people close enough to be called, uh, considered family members. So. Was it your trauma in the past that led you into your career profession? You know, that's kind of a Freudian question, right? Like, because I would like to say no, you know, I didn't know. So subconsciously, probably, I mean, I always had this burning desire to know, uh, 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 to understand people. So I don't, I can't say directly that, yeah, that's why I consciously chose it. It's not why I consciously chose it, but I can tell you with 100% um, feeling that that is, what has, that is what personally saved me is what I know about psychology. And a lot of times, like when I'm on Facebook and doing my, my Facebook thing, and um, um, when I just did decide to heal, what I said, what I say now, what I said then is that this is so incredibly hard. I have a PhD in psychology. I have a black belt. I study martial arts, the science of discipline. You know, that's all about discipline. I have a strong religious background. And it took all of that and I'm still balled up on the floor at age 45 in the bathroom. So I'm like, I don't know how people do it who don't have resources, emotional resources, financial resources, academic resources. I don't know how, like this is so incredibly, the pain is so deep, so entrenched that I don't know how people do it without help and, and resources. It's, so that is definitely, that definitely helps me a lot. You know, and so that's why, I mean, that's why I do what I do in terms of trying to reach people and trying to support people in their healing um, and, and be able to say things to people that they, that they, that, that, because it doesn't scare me off. So, you know, uh, like one of the first uh, things that, to be able to sell, to say to someone at any given day, like, I don't want to be here today. Like, I just literally don't want to be here. I want to be dead. And not, and not have them call 911, you know. Like, if you call 911 every time I have the thought that I don't want to be here, like, they'll just stop showing. I mean, like, you can't. But people don't get that. Like, people don't understand like, that that's such a common thought. And to just be able to have a space where you can say, this is one of those days that I, I had a trigger or whatever, and I just don't know. I, I, know it's, I know I'm not going to feel this way tomorrow, but, like, I don't want to be here. And, and one of the reasons is because as adult survivors, you've been dealing with this so long. I mean, can you imagine? Hopefully not. I'm sure some of someone in here can, but hopefully from the age of four, six, eight, carrying this, like, like that's a lot. Like that's tremendous to, for a child to carry that into adulthood. So like we, so that's the scary part, the hurtful part. But when I laugh, when I'm able to laugh, only with survivors, you only laugh with survivors, right? I was like, we've been dealing with this so long that by the time we actually tell somebody, like we have devised so many cockamamie contraptions in our mind to deal with situations that because, so when I say it to you, it sounds traumatic and I'm like, but like, this is like, it may sound traumatic to you, but like, this is me, like this is what goes on up here. And, but what happens is when you try to explain it to people, they panic. And it's like, no, 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 you don't have to panic because I've been carrying this for like 20 years or 30 years. Like, I'm, I'm way past the panic stage, you know. So even when we feel the pain, I mean, we get it, we understand. I mean, that we feel the depth of the pain, but at the same time, it's so, I, I love working with survivors because, and I always say and report, you know, on, on Facebook that the resilience 
of survivors like um, is amazing. Like it's amazing that you can take those experiences and live in real life. One of the other lectures that I that I give, I talk a lot about. Um, one of the things I mentioned, you know, when I talk about all the trauma of childhood, and then I ask the question, and then what do you think happened to these people? You know, and people are like, oh, they. I'm like, nope. We become your psychology professors. We become your doctors. We become your lawyers. Your accountants. Your parents. Your girlfriends. Your, you know, your boyfriends. Like we, like there's, like we are in society. I mean, we're, we're living amongst people, and it's because the resilience is so incredible and so great. And so I always say that for survivors that we have the capacity literally to change the world because no one knows more about the harshness and the cruelty of humanity and no one knows more about the resilience of it than survivors. So that's the beauty of it. So. On yes. that psychological aspect and bent, um, is that why you call it survivor instead of victim? Yes. Self and power? Yes, absolutely. We go from victim to survivor. And then we go from survivor to thriver. So, but it's a kind of a phase where we learn how to, where we actually begin to actually thrive. But we're, by the time we're, we're adults and we've, we've survived the worst of it. It doesn't feel like it, always feels like it. <laughs> what do um, the voices in your head and stuff, what kind of, what kind of things like, do they say, do they deal with, do they? There's typically, there's typically, the, there's always the inner child voice. I mean, even for adults who don't experience trauma. So, so there's some basic stuff. Like, most of psychology will tell you who identify. Like, Freud says there's the id, ego, and the superego. Transactional analysis it says there's the parent, the child, and the adult. So that's like, that's going to be like, so, so those are not like foreign concepts. But if you don't see, that's where my psychology comes in handy. It doesn't feel like a threat to me. But if I say to someone, the voice is in your head, like they're like, oh, like that's, you know, then it, so that's like sort of where my psychology comes in handy because I understand those concepts differently than what just, what just a layman uh, or a layperson does. So there's always, so there's always the inner child voice. Uh, the wounded child, and again, that may, depending on the experiences of abuse, it may be one, especially if abuse was spread out, like it was in my case, so there may be, you know, two or three inner children, depending on how the abuse occurred. There's almost always an angry person. Almost, I mean, that's where the guilt and shame comes from. So a lot of times there's this back and forth bicker between an inner child and an angry person. It's your fault. It's your fault. It's your fault. It's your fault. It's what, you know, that kind of goes on. You know, you're a horrible person. You should kill yourself. No, I don't want to kill myself. I mean, you know, like, like, can you imagine, like, walking around with this all day? Like, triggers? Like, you, like, you can walk down the street and have 20 triggers, you know, depending on the day. And so there's always that. And then there's typically the, uh, uh, the adult voice that manages to, you know, try to always keep that balance. Somebody's got to go to school, and um, um, and so you know there's your doubt. A lot of times there there's um, like a faith voice, faith that just like that just reminds you that no matter what everything's gonna be okay, you know. Um, and um, and all, and a lot of times there there's a chameleon voice that will be whatever that person needs to be in the time that they need to be in. So that will give, and those are five voices that I recommend, that I, that I um, reveal in the, in the play, The Talking Trees. So the chameleon, the inner child, the adult, the angry person, um, and, and, the, and the, the person of faith. So, uh, and they just kind of collaborate depending on what, you know, what the situation, because you have to, again, you have to like be in, in life. So there's this constant urge to want to be or make sure that you're safe all the time, you know, growing up without ever feeling safe in the world. I mean, like, that's huge. Like, safety issues are huge. So you have to pretend like you're safe, even though, <laughs> even though you never feel safe, you have to pretend like you're safe. So, you know, so you have to carry out all these activities that are contrary to anything that you've ever, like, genuinely felt, you know. So, um, did I, did, does that answer your question? Okay, so they just kind of collaborate and, and talk. That's why, I mean, that's one of the reasons why, again, why I think that survivors are so resilient and so ingenious, 
to be able to do and operate in a world. Someone, someone once asked me, like, how did you get through not one, not two, but three psychology programs without ever disclosing? And I never thought about that. I like that never crossed my mind. I'm like, I don't know, I'm good like that. I mean, I, you know, like that's how committed I was to the secret. Like that's how committed I was, you know, and to be able to operate in a world like that. Um, like that, and sometimes I say this by words, like that's the crazy part. Because like acknowledging voices in your head is not crazy. What's crazy is the fact that I've spent, the number of holidays I've spent with violators, that's crazy. The number of years I've spent at a dinner table as an adult, that's crazy. That's crazy. I'll take the voices in my head any day. <laughs> then I spend one more day with my with my perpetrators. I mean I did that, you know, that's just very painful. So did you for, forgive people done that to you? Nope, that's not in my book of healing. <laughs> some people swear by it. Some people swear by forgiveness. Um, um, that's not that's not in my book of healing. I, and I know, and a lot, of, and, you know, it's always interesting to me that uh, survivors uh, will all, will frequently tell this tell tell the, about their experiences and then say, "But I forgive him," right? Uh, and I'm like, like, I'm not impressed by that because what I see. Typically, is that survivors will say they've forgiven their violators, but still blame themselves. Like that doesn't that doesn't make sense. Like, you, how do you forgive your violators and if you're still blaming yourself? So I always say that forgiveness is required in healing, but it's the forgiveness of you blaming yourself, not forgiveness of the violators. I don't. There's not. There's not. There's, uh, except for religious purposes, you know. I don't. I don't see. I don't see the point in. I don't see that directly related to healing. I do see that, it, that, that it's important for people to work through whatever they need to work through, but that's a, that's a lifelong process. That's a lifelong process. I always say this um, to survivors um, when I'm consulting with them, is that really there's nothing that you absolutely must do to heal, and there is nothing that you can do that's gonna heal you today. I mean, so healing is a lifelong process. I always say about my, my personal idea about forgiveness is that forgiveness is something that arises in people. It's not really an act that you do. It arises in people when you get to the point that you have enough, enough of your own humanity and enough resolution in a situation that it just kind of goes away. I don't think you have to actively heal. I don't think that you have to say, I'm going to forgive, or actively forgive, brother. I don't think you have to say, I'm going to forgive you today, because that doesn't work. If you ask most survivors if they forgive, the, most survivors who, that I have talked to who say they forgive, they don't want to see the person. They don't want to have anything to do with the person. They don't, so, like, what is forgiveness? Because there are people in my life that I have forgiven for things. And when I forgive them for things, it means that you act as if that thing no, never occurred. Like that's my understanding and idea of forgiveness is that you then act as if it, it as if you treat that person as if that never occurred. And one of the reasons why my pain lasted so long <coughs> is because I did do that. I did for, I did for, I did forgive. I thought I had forgiven, and what I was doing was carrying around so much pain for the idea because you know doing what someone had asked me to do instead of dealing with my own pain. And so that's what I find a lot of survivors do. They say they forgive it and they carry so much of it in, you know, in themselves because then what that means is that, is again, it's kind of going, going back to what I talked about earlier, when you have to make yourself that small you know, to be in the world, um, it becomes quite, quite incredible. So, I mean, I think if, I think if people, I have, talked to, I have talked to a few survivors that genuinely forgive, have forgiven their violators. One of the things that they that has occurred is that they have actually actually had a chance to talk. Their 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 survivors, their perpetrators actually requested forgiveness. They actually requested forgiveness. That's not typical. 
And I think if when if forgiveness is requested, then that takes it to a whole different level, then you have to kind of figure out what you're going to do with it. But that's rare. Typically doesn't happen. So that's not in my book. If I wake up one morning and I don't, I don't, I don't go out of my way to hate people, um, but I don't, but I don't, the question of forgiveness in my own healing journey never, it just doesn't, doesn't arise, not an issue for me. So, and I figure, you know, if I get to heaven and, 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 and you know, they're there and I'm not because I didn't forgive them, then me and God are going to have a serious talk. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> I, you know, so, yeah. Have your kids... Handle it. Handle what? Just the situation, knowing what happened to you. Uh, you know, I didn't tell them until they were my daughter. My daughter was 15. Only recently have I even had this conversation with my with my son, because we're not nearly as close and, and um, as my daughter and I. And when I told my daughter when she was 15, and I and that was in the point where I told her like I'm not, I can't be around the family anymore. We're not going any more family reunions. Blah blah blah. And she, um, she said, uh, uh, you have to imagine my daughter being a diva. She, uh, she goes, she goes, well, why, why, like, why did you spend that much time with them in the first place if this happened to you, you know? And I said, um, I said, because I thought I needed them. And she looked me square in the eye. She goes, well, I had known for five minutes, and I could have told you you didn't need them. <laughs> she's like, I've known for five minutes. Like, really? It took you 30 years to figure that out? Like, you just told me, and I could have told you you didn't need them. <laughs> you know? So I'm like, well, you're smarter than I am. <laughs> you know? I was just thinking, as a, as a parent, you would, you know, my mother had said something like that to me, how, how terribly you would have felt for them, you know, having to have gone through that and just um, being very, I guess, overprotective of your mother, maybe, like, for your daughter being very overprotective of you and very. Yeah, probably because they were older by the time that we found out. I think generally, <coughs> generally, she's overprotective, but she's overprotective because, you know, I have fainting spells and she doesn't know why. I mean, so it's, you know, that kind of stuff. So by the time, so I mean, in some sense, it probably makes a better connection for her. She is overprotective about me in, in that way. But, you know, there's so many other things that come into play. You know, for her to worry, by the, time, by the time she found out about that, she was already overprotective. Does so. she hate your family then, now? No. I don't preach hate. I don't, you know, I mean, I don't, I mean, we, you know, we, we talk a little bit about them. I don't, I don't talk about it with my children. I don't, for me, that's not, that's not what they're there for. So I don't, I don't use them then. I don't have those discussions with my children about that. So. They just, she, they know why we don't see family anymore and they're okay with that. So, yeah. mm -hmm. What do you tell somebody who was a victim, knows deep down that something happened but can't actually remember? That is horrible. I mean, that is, and it's real. That's, again, why it's important to understand and find out information about um about adult survivors so that you have that information and you can be begin to connect it you don't you don't need you don't need a, a actual memory to to heal from and sometimes that makes healing very tricky when people don't have memories and this is we we'll love to hear all day i'm sorry I mean, this, I, that's a really good question like it really interferes with the healing process and not just the heal, not really the healing process itself, but it interferes with the person's sense that they have a right to heal. You know, so if I don't remember, then why am I depressed? Why do I, you know, have these five voices in my head talking to me? Why do I not want to be touched? Why do I not feel this way? Why do I, you know? And so you have, you may have all of the, all of the symptoms, but you don't have a memory. Like you know something happened, but you don't have a, a memory from that. And I say, if you know, you know. Like that's that. Like that's all there is to it. You don't need to know the actual event. I mean, and that's and that's really a tricky thing. A lot. I don't know what the percentage would be, but if you talk to most survivors, they will tell you they had probably forgotten more than they remember. 
So some survivors want to remember. Uh, some survivors, like me, like I'm glad that for the memories that I lost, like I'm really glad that I remember most of it. You know, <laughs> like I consider that a gift. Other other people feel like they really need to know, especially. But I know who. Like at least I know who. Some survivors don't even know who. Like they don't. Like they don't know. Like like they think that I have. Uh, um, deal with a lot of survivors who think they were, they were two years, who know that they were two years old, or I have some who tell me that it's been from birth, but you know, they don't know, they, or sometimes they'll say, I know it was my parent, but I don't remember, or I know it was somebody, but I don't remember who, you know, so that, I mean, it's just one more of those pieces, you know, that just kind of nudge at you, but, but if you know, you know, if you know, then it's really important to engage in a healing process, and know that you have a right to the healing process, regardless of how much you remember or don't remember. It's not about what you remember, it's about healing yourself because you, you've gone, you're part, you're part of the process. And you have all those same feelings and, and issues and all that stuff. Important. Good question. Well, I mean, violators a lot of times rely on stuff like that, not remembering person being too young to remember or you know so those are those are things that keep violators safe and so we don't we don't want to give them a chance by withholding our own healing process because we don't have memory but that's one of the issue, uh, one of the other issues with with the tendency of survivors to want to tell their story <coughs> because it's, uh, stories can always be challenged. Exactly. And that's why you hear, I, I try to be careful about not, not using that word when I speak about my experience of childhood sexual abuse. Like, this is not a story, like, <laughs> you know? Uh, um, and so I, don't, I, I, I intentionally don't, don't um, thrive on trying to give people details about what happened and, you know, and all that stuff, because it's not about the exact story, it's about the experience of, of the betrayal and living with the pain. How did you um, overcome some of that? Because it sounds like you didn't um, start kind of living or going through it until after you were probably married and had children. How did you um, get past some of that to, one, to have children of your own, knowing what happened to you, and to allow yourself to be in that relationship? Um, I never had problems with relationships. Some people do. I never had problems with sex or relationships. Some people do for obvious, obvious reasons. Um, um, I, I, I will share this with you, my opinion, and I don't know, I, can, I, I don't, I mean, we don't talk about sex a lot because nobody talks about sex a lot, but I can say, I can, I can say this uh, this much with people that I know who have, who have a lot of difficulty with sexual relationships, that sort of stuff. Um, for me, the first time I had consensual sex, it was so incredibly different. It was like, oh, oh, like this, like this, like that. I mean, it's so it was it's, it was so clear to me that I had never like that was not anything remotely like what had happened to me, and so so I don't have problems with sex because it's very clear. I mean, like it's like that. What I whatever you know that that happened during abuse. And it's tough because that was my initiation into my own sexual abuse was my initiation into my own sexuality. Obviously, that's like really traumatic. Um, um, uh, so I so that was never a problem for me. Uh, but relationship wise, I just happened to have I just happened to meet my husband at the time that uh, that I was in therapy for the first time. As, <coughs> as the universe would have it, you know, I was in therapy and I tried to get out of a relationship. And he wouldn't let me get out of the relationship, you know. I, so I so I explained to him, which most people don't have. Again, remember, half of survivors never tell a soul, even their even their partners or their spouses. So, and most survivors that I know and talk to have never even talked to their spouses about it or their partners about it. And so, so my husband has known from the beginning that I was that I was a survivor. But it makes for some rocky times in a relationship. It makes for some, some really rocky times. So he's, I, I'm blessed. We've been married almost 22 years. And, um, and um, you know, he's 
mean, he's just a wonderful man. Because he's a wonderful man, when it comes to dealing with survivor issues, he's horrible. He's just horrible. He's just almost useless. What except, does that understand? Yeah, except he loves me to death, you know, so, and takes really good care of me. But I don't, I, and then one, that's one of the things I talk to survivors about. Not everybody can be a listener. And oftentimes those closest to you cannot be a listener for you. So, you know, it, but it's hard when you're in the thick of it, you know, and you want everybody to listen, you know. <laughs> and they're walking around like this, can't hear you, can't, you know. So, so, yeah. So it, yeah, there's, relationships are really tricky for survivors. By far, probably one of the worst issues that we deal with. So we have a lot of failed relationships. So, more so, even more so. I mean, in, in traditional society, we have a lot of failed relationships, but that's even worse, I think, when it comes to survivors. Between the trust issues and, and the abandonment issues, they're really, really, really tough. So did you not have any issues with having your children, like, worrying about what you know, could possibly happen to them? Just I homeschooled my children. And I spent every minute that I can with my children. And now I want them out of my house. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, I was, I was very protective. Yeah, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> with good reason, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I remember my husband and I having an argument when my daughter was probably about five. I was like, nope, you can no longer do that. You can no longer do that. And he's like, I don't, <laughs> yay. <laughs> yay. <laughs> you know. so, so, I mean, he understood. He was clear. He didn't have, you know. So, so yeah. I, I understand you have too much pain, but you never done stupid stuff because that, like, Crazy or do, something. do I ever feel like I want to do something crazy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, that's part of the voices. I mean, that's what I mean. Like, that's why I think we're, like, really resilient, because we don't go around, like, you know, doing the stuff that the people in our head tell us to do. Yeah. <laughs> so. But you never done anything. No. No. No, it's so much. I mean, it's so, it's so, it's so big. And I, 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 I'm to the point now that I embrace it with gratitude. But I mean, like literally, it more, I, I think a lot of us have more ideate, more thoughts of self-harm, honestly, than we do of harming, of harming other people. And we do, and psychologically, we do a lot more self-harm, you know, than, than, the, than the desire to harm other people. I, I particularly like working with incest survivors because I mean I think we're just the I mean the worst case scenario like I said to, to never even feel safe in your own home like even now like I don't I don't let people I don't, I'm very very particular about who I let in my home you know uh, and only now do I see like my kids don't invite people over like if they do like I'm like really like I you know I'm now starting to notice like I'm anxious like when are they leaving and where are they you know you can't have company up there I mean you know that kind of stuff so um, um, so 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 it's more it's more of that sort of stuff not that you just like really want to go out and, and, and hurt someone I think the pain because I and I think a lot of times because the pain that we deal with is left over from childhood and so like children don't think about hurting other people does that make sense? So, you know, so I maybe I wonder, that raises an interesting question. I wonder if, you know, adult victims would have more more ideas about, you know, wanting to hurt someone than, than child victims. So, but yeah, don't cross this one down. So <laughs> it's encompassed with with incest. The thing about incest <coughs> is not like you're living, like you're literally living in it, like you're living in it. So you have all this stuff, like you have the good stuff, whatever that is, however much that might be. Like you have the good stuff and the bad stuff and all this other stuff that go these people that come in and out. And so it's too much for children to filter out. Like it's just it's just too much. So you know we get through it as best we can. Like Eric was talking about with the, with the go crazy, you think my, part of that might be 
um, your control as you develop your, your your voices in your head, and they help you control a situation and control your life. Is it is part of the, is that the main reason why you probably don't go crazy? Is because yep. the going crazy would would take away the, that element of your control. Absolutely. Yep. I think, well, I, you know, the personas come and they play their role. I mean, you, you know, that's how you kind of hold on or whatever, you know, and so they help. I think the, the, some people say, like, people who do, especially, like, do drugs or, be, or pick up deviant behavior, there's some research that suggests that those people who do drugs or do deviant behavior actually can heal faster than people like me who do nothing but live with perfection, you know, like, because at least they, they are like, they're closer to it, like they're closer to the negativity, and so they know they're at least responding to it versus people who just, like, really numb out and live in denial, and then, like, when it, you know, <laughs> so, and have to get, you know, deal with the facade, you know, is harder than, than people who at least respond to it. Like I just got like I just decided in my life that I just wouldn't respond to it. Period. Like literally, just pretend like it never happened. Like literally pretend like this never happened. So, which is what you have to do when people ask you to continuously be in, in an environment with your perpetrators. Otherwise, you can't, you're con you're constantly consciously responding to the environment, and you can't you can't your your brain can't do that. It can't. Thank you all. It's been great. Appreciate your class time. Yeah. Thank you for coming in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing your experience. Thank you. The um, Facebook is called Talking Trees Survivors. That's what it is on Facebook. And I also have a website called Talking Trees Survivors.com. Facebook and a website, Talking Trees Survivors.